Welcome everybody to today's Law Department Operations Survey webinar. Today's topic, the broader influence of Law Department Operations. Before we start, I wanna talk for just a minute about the Law Department Operations Survey. Um, we've been publishing this for 14 years now. It's designed to provide insight into the critical success factors of effectively managed corporate law departments. It is a monstrous survey, 300 data points, about 100 respondents, one per company. If you haven't downloaded it yet, please feel free to visit www.ldosurveyreport.com and grab a copy for yourself. The LDO survey is managed or helped by our advisory board, who I wanna give a shout out to. You can see the names listed here. Some of really the, the brightest light within law department operations are on our advisory board. They help us figure out what we should learn each year. They drive response, they are invaluable. Um, and they are, all of them, just great people and pleasures to work with. So everyone feel free to, uh, as you bump into these people, make sure that you get to know them if you can, they're all worth knowing and they, they get our thanks. Additionally, we need to thank our great partners and sponsors, um, starting with our title sponsor, Deloitte, um, as well as the other companies on there. I'd also like to shout out um, Contract Pod AI. Jerry Levine from that organization is on our faculty today. Um, and when it comes to the kinds of issues we're talking about, um, uh, Jerry really is, he's been an in, in in-house counsel. He is in-house at Contract Pod AI. He's been in-house at other companies. He's um, an expert. So. Um, today's faculty, I should have introduced myself. I'm Brad Blickstein, uh, principal at the Blickstein Group, um, and also the, really the publisher of the Law Department Operations Survey. I'll serve as your host today. Um, we have Mark Ross with us. Mark is principal at a Deloitte Legal Business Services. Hey, Mark. Good morning. And Jerry Levine, Chief Evangelist and General Counsel in the, of the Americas at Contract Pod AI. Like I said, I think we are in for a treat today when it comes to topics called law department operations and especially as they impact uh, a contract management, which is a, a topic we'll talk about a lot today. Again, Mark and Jerry, stone cold experts, um, outstanding uh, uh, folks who understand the space extremely well. Um, we've saved some time at the end for some questions. Feel free to populate the, uh, you all know how to use Zoom webinar. Please go ahead and populate the, the question feel whenever you like and we will get to them either during the session or at the end of the session. So with all of that um, set aside, let's start with our first topic. One of the big themes in the, that we learned from this year's survey results is that legal operations professionals, what I like to call LDOs, um, a lot of prominent operations professionals, others call legal ops or in-house legal ops, same thing. They are their influence outside the legal function, outside the law department and the law firms that serve them um, have been grown. And here's uh, the first place we see this or the first data point we have to support this is we ask the same question every year. What do you consider to be your top three key performance indicators? And the number two KPI this year, and this is the highest this has ever been, is value provided to the corporation. So usually we, you, very frequently we see um, that the number one is always, it's some spend related metric and you see a handful of spend related metrics um, peppered throughout the list of results. But number two is not really directly spend related. It is specifically the value provided throughout the corporation. So um, Mark, why don't you, uh, let's kick off with you. What is, what's going on? Thanks, Brad. And again, <clears throat> Brad, thank you very much for inviting me to participate today. It's got greatly appreciated. Jerry, nice to connect and present with you as well. My pleasure, Mark. Thank you. Of and course. thank you, Brad, for having us. So when, when, I, look, when I look at this, guys, um, first of all, I'm not surprised. It also raises certain questions. If you look at a number of the other KPIs on this list, it is quite easy to quantitatively value and identify those KPIs. You know, I, I would love 
and perhaps the conversation isn't for today, Brad, it's another day, it's a deeper dive into, you know, what KPIs are these organizations actually leveraging to define value to the corporation? But if we look at it a, at a holistic level, uh, this is of no surprise to me. You know, our legal department clients are increasingly telling us that they are being viewed by the CFO, by the CEO, as beyond just a cost center. They are being asked to demonstrate what value they can provide uh, to the organization beyond just controlling outside council fees year on year on year. And that value can be you know, across a number of variables. Obviously, we're going to be talking a lot about contract management uh, later on in this presentation today. So I don't want to steal our collective thunder there. You know, but if you're thinking about you know, some of the statistics about the percentage of lost contract value that are frequently regaled as being in existence because of ineffective contract management. There's an immediate opportunity for the legal department through more effective contract management processes, contract management technology to identify and close some of that value gap. You know, other areas that I think of, you know, I think about the insurance industry as well. You know, they're dealing with thousands and thousands of third party subpoenas flowing into their organization. You know, and sometimes they're able to bill you know, third parties for the production of information? Are they maximizing what they can achieve? Are they maximizing, are they turning that particular work stream into an actual, you know, cost center, you know, a, you know, a profit center rather than being a cost center for the organization? So that's just a couple of examples uh, that, that I'm familiar with. I was. I, I would add, I'm happy to listen to Mark talk all day. His voice is so soothing and pleasant and just a lovely, a lovely tone. I think one thing that I would add to what he just, to what he just provided is that the idea of the value provided to the corporation, to the business, to the organization is somewhat of a holistic, I think he used the word holistic because it begins, it begins consuming some of these other KPIs. If you're looking at what the value is and you say, well, how do I calculate that? Maybe you're not just looking now at the contracts closed, but also, you know, whether or not the your legal team was able to get specific provisions in. Um, oh, oh, many years ago, when I was at a pharmaceutical company, there was a celebration in the legal department, for example, when they found out that a contract that had been terminated had a breakup fee. So that brought in all of a sudden the legal the legal department was the largest sales sales person of the quarter with the breakup fee in this contract. But there's this idea of and especially for legal operations professionals, not just the idea of the value they're adding to the department to their legal team, but where that value gets seen and observed and is quantifiable amongst uh, finance, HR, sales, and how they are able to show how that's used um but it's it's not always the easiest concept to show N nodding violently there Je jerry as you you know i, I was gonna make a, a similar point but but you said it so eloquently if you think about the wording the specific wording in this kpi it's not value provided to the legal department it's value provided to the corporation, to the enterprise. And that in and of itself goes to the heart of the, you know, the elevation of the GC role to being a more strategic advisor to the business. It frankly, it goes to, you know, one of the key compelling reasons why, you know, I joined Deloitte two years ago because of the multidisciplinary capabilities that our clients were needing to solve, you needed more than just legal to bring to the table in solving those problems. It becomes an integrated solution 
involving procurement, finance, HR, IT. And, and so I actually love the way this KPI is even phrased, Brad. Great. And uh, yeah, a couple of points. One is, you know, there are law departments out there that are today profit centers. They are, you know, where when they do the math at the end of the year, they have brought in more money for their corporation than the corporation has spent on the legal function. So it, it can be done. A lot of times there's a lot of IP related to that, but it, it can be done. Um, and, and folks out there are doing this. And, and I put this quote from um, Kiran Malavarapu, who is heads legal operations at Liberty Mutual up here, because um, I kind of like the way he phrases it. He sees it as you know, a lot of companies have been investing in legal ops for years, and now they're wanting those those investments to pay off. They're looking to, to cash out on those investments and get more value from their legal operations folks. And obviously, legal ops folks are seeing that in their in their KPI. KPI. So let, let's talk for a minute about some of what this really means from closer to a day to day, um, closer to a day to day situation. So. Um, we try to put some, you know, it's a big survey, so we try to put some numbers around everything we do. And we asked them, we asked our respondents, how involved are you in enterprise-wide, meaning outside the legal department, strategic initiatives? And what you see is in, in the most recent survey, which took place in late 2021, um, more than half say that they are frequently or very frequently involved in enterprise-wide um, strategic initiatives, and only a handful say they never are. Um, which actually is up substantially from about what, what's about 43 percent said the same thing in, in 2020. So from like 43 percent to, to 52 percent. So um, Jerry, why don't you take the first run at this one? But what are we again? Is this what you're seeing out there? Are you seeing more legal ops people actually interfacing more frequently with um, actually not interfacing more frequently, but but being more involved in broader corporate initiatives? Uh, I think I think so, and I, I do think we're seeing it. We're also seeing that, you know, as a company that sells contract management and legal department software, we're seeing more folks at the table as well. There's often a greater interest on from both the non-legal department teams as well as the legal department teams. So we're getting those questions as we're selling, as we're as we're having these discussions. And even even offline and in other, you know, just will we, we be able to use this with our finance team? Will we be able to use it with our procurement team? How is that working? One thing that I, I thought was interesting is, and and I think it's it's good to see the two slot the two graphs up there together, is it looks like the growth is really coming from the occasionally, the folks who used to do it occasionally are now doing it more and more frequently. Because if you look at the, the very rarely, rarely never, there's not so much of a change there, Brad. But I think what we're seeing is the, the teams that were already involved are getting more involved. And so now, now the question is, is, is for those legal departments, for those LDO folks who are in, who are rarely, very rarely or never, why is that? What is what is the impact on their company? What are they doing? And as the more general, as we've seen occasionally grow in the more frequently and very frequently, you know, where where are these coming from? And it seems to be a lot of, well, you could solve this problem for one group, but maybe we could solve this for everybody in the company. I, I can give you just an anecdotal data point, Jer Jerry and Brad. Uh, and I had such a conversation literally about an hour ago this morning, but the number of times that I and the legal business services team have conversations connected to a given pursuit that we are responding to, where the conversation goes something along these lines, who's the buyer? Yeah. Is it procurement? Is it legal? Is it IT? Is it finance? Is it sales? The volume of those interactions, those conversations is increasing year on year on year, which indicates that you know, frequently it will be legal, but they will have procurement, IT and finance as interested stakeholders, but very frequently we'll be dealing with procurement or IT, 
and legal will be an interested stakeholder. If you think through, Jerry, you know, your world you know, and the business requirements collection documentation, that never just sits within legal. It's a cross-functional, enterprise-wide collection of data points around must-haves, nice-to-haves, not essentials to determine you know, the functionality requirements of a given solution. And that is happening day in, day out in every interaction we're having with clients. And Mark, one thing that's interesting, and this is a person, again, this is anecdotal. Uh, I will say that I have no data to back this up other than what I have seen is that as uh, I would say, and it, again, very anecdotal. I'm going, to call, I'm going to preface that by saying very anecdotal. The more conversations I've had with new GCs, millennial, you know, as millennials and gen, or Generation Y, whatever you want to call them, are starting to take their seat at the in the exec in the C-suite. There's been this. There's been a lot more of well, I need to bring these other people in from the GC. I need to get more of this in. But it's also happening with with large teams as well, where you know they're beginning. There's begins to be this more collaborative aspect, and saying, you know, even from our customers, they're saying, well, we already know this has to work with our sales team. We need this to be, we need to be this to be across the enterprise because we want legal. Uh, and I'm sure that there is this uh, this almost ego ego. I, I don't want to say ego. I guess egocentric. For the legal department, we want to know everything that's going on. So if we've got this in our control, but we've involved the enterprise, now we know everything that's happening. There's no more surprises, which really benefits the company and the legal team, because there's no longer going to be, hey, by the way, did you know so-and-so went and signed an agreement by themselves and didn't tell anyone, and now we have to do this work, which... You know, it happens when they're when everything is very siloed, you do get this. So the idea of not from a from a an active practicing lawyer sense is, you know, you don't want to be surprised. No lawyer lawyers hate surprises, as I'm sure we all know. Uh, and the less surprises that you can have, the happier your legal team will be, and then hopefully the happier the enterprise is because they know they're getting the right amount of service, the right amount of integration. So let's um, let's just move, leave the world for a minute of uh, of anecdotes because we do actually have some data on how often folks interface. So let, let's uh, run through some of these. We asked the same question. Um, we asked this question of a few folks um, or of everyone. Please indicate the number of times per weeks. Excuse me, per week you interface with these different functions, and we have six of these. So um, most of our most of our folks or our respondents um, do interface with finance weekly, mostly once to twice a week. A um, little less in the executive suite, but about still about two thirds of our legal ops people. Um, these are not GCs. These are legal ops people um, interface with the executive suite at least once a week. Um, HR, mostly again, only about 75% do interface with HR at least once a week. Mostly, again, one time, one to two times a week is most common. Similar for compliance, um, very, very similar for compliance. Um, although we're seeing even more folks in, uh, interface with compliance more frequently, um, three to five or more than five times a week is reasonably robust in that cohort. IT. Um, you know, again, almost everyone interfaces with IT some of the time, a little less than half, one to two times a week, but a little, just about half um, interface with IT more than twice a week. Um, and similar numbers or really different numbers, I should say, for information governance. This is a place where many of our legal ops people never interface with information governance or security um, and those who do not that often. So those are so we sort of ran through kind of six different functions pretty quickly there. Um, Mark, where would you like to start? I look at this from a talent lens. 
I find that incredibly interesting. And I, and I would have liked to have seen, you know, what these results were if you were asking this question five years ago, Brad. What is crystal clear to me is that in a law department operations function, the skill sets, qualifications, credentials of the individuals leading and supporting that function look very different to the traditional skill sets required of practicing lawyers. Uh, you know, if you think about financial acumen, IT acumen, uh, those aren't necessarily the skill sets that you automatically associate, you know, with uh, lawyers trained in the traditional Socratic method of, uh, you know, of, of legal study. So I, I look at this through the lens of talent and find it incredibly interesting. And, and I would have loved to have been able to see, Brad, and perhaps you have these data points, how these trends have changed over the last, say, five years. Yeah, this this question we only started asking I think a couple of years ago, so we have a couple of years of of, um, of history there. Not as much as, um, not as much as I, as I think we'd like to. Um, as much as not as we'd like to. Jerry, what do you uh, what do you think? I, I think part of it is also reflected in the growth of IT. But uh, Mark's point is, you a lot of lawyers are not trained in making these decisions or if they are they are you know they're they're not used to making them um and i think when you look at it even the interface numbers show the classic legal with the classic legal touch points um so i think on the last the last slide with hr was a higher was a fairly high percentage security and information governance um you know you could see that you could see that they're not touching. The, uh, well, thanks. Actually, the purple shows that most people feel they interact with HR I'll, I'll quite a, one to two times a week. Compliance is always closely linked to legal. The the IT one I think is growing because we're seeing more of a need for for lawyers to interact with their IT teams, whether from a operational standpoint or from a question answer standpoint. And in fact, you know, five years ago when I was first purchasing uh, contract management software for my, at my prior company, we barely involved IT. The only question was, is it cloud-based or is it on-prem? Uh, and now, in, again, in every conversation, IT wants to be involved. We're getting a significant amount of security questions, which, of course, makes sense. This is secure comp data you want to keep confidential. But the increase just shows the increasing uh, de -siloization. I I've just made up a word of the legal department. You know, people will make jokes about the ivory tower or, or whatever, but the walls are crumbling down. And of course, you also have more lawyers who are doing, who are, especially in larger companies, who, are function, who have a functional area. They're not just a corporate generalist. They have they focus on SaaS contracts only, or they focus only on IT purchasing. And so you begin to have more of that contact, which also means that you have dedicated knowledge. And again, there's a silo. You you want to break that down, but you do have more interfacing, more interaction, and you start bringing specialist specialized knowledge into those. For smaller departments, it's more of a, you know, I have to interact with these people. I have to have a broad range of knowledge. And you can, I think, I think this is reflecting that as well. So let's, uh, let's move on sort of to our, our final data point in this segment, um, which is around cross-functional objectives, um, where we're talking about, <coughs> excuse me, situations like perhaps a contract management program that involves multiple functions outside the law department. And, um, you know, a third of our audience or our respondents say that they are involved in such objectives very frequently and another third um, frequently. So, so most of our audience here are frequently involved in cross-functional um, initiatives. And again, we, we provide 
a contract management program as an example of, of one, which is going to set us up for the second half of our presentation, obviously. So um, what do you guys think of this? What do you, is that what you're seeing out there? What, what can, how, how can LDOs make sure that they are providing as much value as they can in an environment where they're looking outside legal more and more? Well, I think we'll touch on this in detail in the next section, Brad, but if you just think through the number of stakeholder groups in an enterprise that are impacted by or touch contracts, you know, this particular question focuses on procurement and legal, but you know, as we've discussed, you know, contracts impact procurement, legal, finance, compliance, HR, IT, infosec, audit, tax. Yeah, that they, they are truly uh, enterprise-wide in their implication, and it is not surprising one iota that you have, you know, over seventy percent of your respondents saying very frequently and frequently to this question. And going on what Mark said, I think this shows usually, uh, again, that I, I know we, I do believe we have data for this, Brad, but a lot of the typical cross-functional request is either coming because sales is saying we need to work with legal better or legal saying we need to work with sales better or procurement is having the same issue. And if you look at the, you, if you, look at where a lot of the demand comes from in initial cross-functional objective seeking it does it does stem from bringing it does stem from controlling and managing the procurement side or the sales side or both you know i think you start seeing those as your typical driver of we have a lot of purchases we need to keep track of everything and we need to know when when renewal dates are. I mean, on a very high level, I think that drives a lot of the the decision making when folks are are picking out their first solution or trying to in, enable additional solutions. They want to solve something that is that is easy to see a result in. It's a lot harder to see a result in. Uh, and I know we have this question come up later. I know it was in your survey. It's a lot harder to say we've solved the problem in e-discovery or be by working cross-functionally. It's very, it's a very clear solution that you can give an example of if you're if you're managing procurement contracts, sales contracts, and working with them to expedite that process. So I I do want to um as, as we move on to sort of segment two in our um, in our webinar today. I do want to just uh, put a, a bow around that as, as part of a segue maybe is, you know, especially around sales agreements, that is a really a place where a legal operations function uh, driven by good contract management can really provide value, right? When you start to think about what the value to the organization is in deals getting closed faster and maybe on better terms and, um, you know, the, all the all the jokes we've all been hearing, you know, for years, the, the revenue delay team and, and all those things, the pejoratives around law departments, uh, you know, that's a place that legal ops folks can really provide value to the entire corporation. A lot of value on the procurement side, for sure, but such much more easily quantifiable value, at least on the, on the revenue side. So one question, this we've been asking for many, many years. Um, are there, maybe every year, are there plans to evaluate or implement any of the following tech in the next 12 months? We split contract management into two segments, um, pre-execution and post-execution contract management. We, we think that they're pretty different disciplines, although they're related. And what we see here, which is interesting, is that they are the tied for the number one answer in terms of um, there, in terms of law departments, do have plans to evaluate or implement those tools over the next 12 months. Um, and we're also seeing, if you look to the far right, the gray, a halfway decent number already have them in their tech stack. So, um, Mark, let's start with you this time. Why, um, you know, you want to talk a little bit about why we're seeing so much movement in this direction? And just real quick before you do, I just want to remind the audience 
We are taking questions. We'll save some time at the end. Use the console, poke your questions in. We'll get to them. Mark? Sure, thanks, Brad. It, it, it's interesting. It's certainly not, su not surprising. It is, I, I agree with the methodology in the survey to segment pre-execution and post-execution because the disciplines, the activities associated with both of those phases are different. Um, that being said, a lot of the leading CLM technologies in the marketplace uh, would profess to tackling both of those buckets. So I even think, Brad, that this 34.5% number, were you to have just asked, do you have plans to evaluate or implement any of the following tech? And there was only one option for contract lifecycle management technology, that number would have been significantly higher. And what that would have shown is that contract lifecycle management technology right now is by far and away the hottest legal technology ticket in town by a distance. Not that I have ever read any survey other than yours, Brad, but if any <laughs> others had occasionally come across my virtual desk over the last few months, they would be saying exactly the same thing. Uh, I, I think, you know, joking aside, you know, I, I saw the ACC <coughs> uh, chief legal officer survey for 2022. I think that was released very recently. And I believe the number was out of the 55% or so of CLOs who stated they would be implementing technology over the next 12 months, 70% of those individuals indicated that technology would be contract management technology. And I, I can't remember exactly, but I think the next highest after that might have been in the 40s. And that is just indicative of a number of things. I think COVID has been a huge accelerator over the last couple of years. You know, organizations needed to respond to shutdowns, shifting in demand, fragmentation of the supply chain. They needed to understand better contract performance, clarify their rights, clarify their obligations. And if they couldn't even find their damn contracts, how on earth could they respond nimbly to those issues? And also, you know, I give credit to the technology providers in what is still a relatively nascent industry, I would say that the leading players in this market are finally starting to meet the promise of this technology, you know, or, you know which you know, it may have been around perhaps 15 years at max, but the functionality is starting to meet the promise. So I think you've got COVID as an accelerator. You've also got the fact that other areas of technology investment, many organizations would think we've dealt with that. We've got that covered. You know, if you took this survey back in 2008, I have no doubt that e-discovery technology would be much, much higher. But you know, that ship to a certain extent has sailed. I'm sure Jerry, you've got some thoughts on this. And Mark, you said very, very early on, if you had done the survey with CL, contract lifecycle management CLM as a single option, I think I agree. I think it would be significantly greater. Um, be, and the, But I would actually add not only just the pre and post execution, but many tools now can do document and contract assembly. They can do... Uh, some of them, uh, mat document management. There's a significant m increase in, for, uh, I think, a movement away from single purpose tools to multi purpose tools. And so, not only are there a, a large number of players in the market, not all of them are as wonderful as we are here at Contract Pod, but uh, 
we are, but we do see that there is a tremendous opportunity and tremendous availability of this need. One thing that I think is driving that is the idea of, and the, this idea of the unstructured data that we all have. Um, contracts are notoriously unstructured data. And a number of the tools that are out there or are on this list are dealing with structured data or are reasonably easy to implement because they don't require a significant process change or analysis into the way business is done. Redoing your, redoing your contract management, redoing all that does require process review, does require uh, you know, understanding a deeper nature of the business. Um, and I think, I think looking at some of the, looking at some of the highest into its highest request and the, the ones where the orange bar is the highest, it's a lot of unstructured information, legal service requests, knowledge management, process automation, uh, spend management and e-billing, the two where you see where it's core you're dealing with numbers but most of the others are taking in something that has to be tracked but is not easily trackable and understanding it and of course you're you're absolutely right having having gone through this having a system in place going into covid was a a life-changing situation because there was no downtime i went home from work on march 15 2020 and I had already set all, everything had been set up. I was actually a customer of Contract Pod AI before I came to work for them. And we didn't have a day break in our, in our service to the company because it was there, it was accessible everywhere. So I think there has been a, you know, for better or for worse, the drive to technology caused by, caused by COVID-19 has been a significant change in both purchasing habits, but also in the way lawyers and law departments operate. So, Jerry, you, you spoke part of what you just said. You were talking about the effectiveness and the difficulty sort of in implementing non-structured data uh, or products around non-structured data. And, you know, what we, I don't, I haven't memorized all of the responses to all 14 years of the survey, but for many years, we have been asking this question, how effective is the following technology? And contract management trails every year. Usually it's, um, it, it actually finishes last this year, um, second to last or third to last, depending on the account. We split between pre-execution and, uh, and post-execution, I think a year or two ago. Now it doesn't finish last, now it finishes last, second to last. Um, what, you know, maybe talk a little more if you can, Jerry, about why, why is it that it is so difficult to get value and effectiveness out of contract management. So Brad, I think one of the core the core issues is again going back to that unstructured data. I I see that someone just posted a question in the chat about this, but to answer the the immediate question from you, I think the idea is if you look at what is the the number one on effectiveness, electronic signature. It is easy to understand. It is, you drop a field into a document and someone clicks that and signs. It's as near to, you know, it's as near to the most simple technology use case on this chart as possible. But contract management, everything on that top end of, of this. And Brad, I did screw up. I wanted to make my joke here about how great we are and how how that that's better, but I guess I I guess I blew my chance on the last. You can make slide. it twice. It's all right. Uh, it's a, it's okay. Um, uh, it, just seeing the smiles from you and Mark has made it worth it. Um, the 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 fact is is the a lot of the products are very similar, and I think where we are now, as Mark noted, is there's a change in the market. There's a lot more maturity in the market and a lot of a difference in what people are buying. When I first purchased a, a product five or six years ago, uh, 
you know, I had promised perfect automation. I had been told you can automate everything. No one will ever have to go through a process. Everything will be automatic. And I said, okay, well, if you're making these promises, sure. Okay. I'll take that. We'll see how it works. 90% of my work was still manual. I mean, e from everything, automate everything to, to 90% manual, it was not really there. Did it at and least now, tell you what it wants you to, what it wanted you to do next, or did it, it just? It, it, it was download and make the edits myself, or find find out where someone had put a document. Um, so like a checklist. It, it 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 barely. I mean, the only part that I really that we were really able to automate was creating your legal request. You could fill out a form and tell us the document type you needed, and then everything else was manual. Uh, although what they what I had been promised was you'll never have to do that, so it was it was kind of a letdown. You know, there's there's a reason why I ultimately picked a different solution. But the the fact is is it can be effective. But I think what what one of the big issues we're seeing is from that five year ago point to today, a lot of companies are still with their original selection. They're still with their original choice on technology, maybe they're coming up for renewal now. And what is out there now is a lot different. But there's also a wide variety. And I talk about this in a comparison to e-discovery, as opposed to just contract management. In 2008, I was working on the Viox trials. E-discovery was completely, effectively a manual process. Uh, the, if you were practicing or involved then, Deckert was making a million dollars a day doing e-discovery. The Deckert, the law firm, was making a million dollars a day doing e-discovery. Today, that entire process uh, in the Viox trial would probably take a week at most, maybe two or three weeks. Um, so there's been a tremendous improvement in machine learning, in, in document analysis, and all of that. But we've also seen a split in the in the e-discovery market. And I don't want to talk too much about e-discovery, but the idea is what we're seeing now in contract management is almost a similar split between CLM, CLM and CLM Lite. Just like there are amazing, amazing services out there for e-discovery that do e-discovery Lite and give you the basic tools, and that, then there are services that do almost everything for you, we're beginning to see the same thing in CLM, that some companies simply need a Excel sheet. Or uh, I think I mentioned when we were talking before, I can create a basic contract database in Notion or Evernote or a different sort of note-taking software. But to really go, and that's great if you've only got a few contracts a month or a year, but the more you get and the more you need out of your CLM, the more you're expecting it to be effective at multiple different services, whether that's document assembly, uh, term extraction, metadata extraction, uh, general, the entire contract life cycle, whether it has to have significant integration. And I think where we are now with the CLM providers is they're finally getting into the point where they're able to say, not only can we take in this unstructured data, but depending on the level you're looking for, depending on the functionality you need, we can take unstructured data and structure it for you, or you can do it yourself. Um, one, one reason, and I, I think what I chose contract pod years ago, when I was trying to pick something out was because my paralegal had left to go to law school. I had a busy team. We didn't have a lot of time to go and abstract the documents, but we needed to know information. So having a tool that could automatically tell me what's in the document with a high degree of certainty made my life a lot easier. So I, I think that's that's really where it is. It's, and I think from a vendor perspective, as opposed to just a customer perspective, I think we're be getting better at explaining what we can actually do with CLM and what is available to the customer, whether you're at that bare CLM light, I just need to manage stuff in a repository to a full featured CLM solution that does everything from, from start to finish and continues tracking afterwards. So, so sorry, Mark. I... So clearly the picking the right 
tool and picking the right type of tool for your need is is critical. Mark, may, maybe you can take more of a run at answering Catherine's question, which is really, um, you know, what advice, what other advice do you have to make sure that um, that to, to process for processing unstructured information in a certainly in a contract management context, but in other contexts too. What 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 other lessons have you learned along the way? Well, I think one of the big gaps that I see is an inability to effectively articulate the business case for investment in CLM technology, understanding what the different value drivers are, how to quantify those value drivers. It's easy to regale that there are benefits associated with turning unstructured data to structured data and having a CLM system so you can proactively, quickly, easily, readily access your contracts. But what does that actually mean to the business? Um, because tragically, Jerry, yours and your competitors' products don't come for free, and there is a cost associated with them. And our clients want to understand not only how to most effectively get the utility out of the products that they purchase, but prior to doing so, they need to build a business case. They need to be able to quantify what does faster speed to execution actually mean for the business? What does it mean to the business if we're able to avoid unapproved consumption because that is not detailed or approved in the given contractual terms you know what happens to the revenue generation cycle of our organization if we are able to locate appropriate templates quicker all of those items you can actually quantify but it never ceases to amaze me the organizations don't seem to have the tools in their toolkit to be able to go down that journey effectively. So before you even think about the actual procurement of a tool, you know, I would encourage all organizations to think through the readiness of their organization and the financial justification, the ROI, for going down that path. Mark, one, sorry, Brad, I, I, I do want to respond to something Mark said that triggered a thought. One thing that we consistently see and with, uh, and is, is this question of, can you help us build our process? Can you explain to us, and Mark, this is very much what you just said, can you explain to us what are, how to justify this ROI? Um, and, and I think it's, it's really true. I think we see the, the most successful, well, everybody's successful with us, but the most successful are, are coming in and saying, we've got a process. We want to accomplish these outcomes. This is what we want to do. And sometimes we do start with, here's what our real goal is. We are losing a lot of time and energy on keeping track of where everything is in the deal cycle. We need to make sure we do that. Okay, well, my first question, and I, I, I like to think of this as actually being a legal design question in addition to being a, uh, a just a consultative models question is, You've got your, you want to lose less things. Well, what do you currently do? Where are things, where are, where is your workflow being lost? Where are, where can we make sure that you don't lose your track in this, in this structure? Uh, so I, I think it's, it's one of those areas where I think the more time you can spend with the vendor or a, a group like Deloitte, in figuring out what you're trying to accomplish and what the process is, uh, is actually going to lead to a significant 
significantly higher return on investment than just putting the tool in. You could put a, a document assembly tool into any process and get, you know, get 50%. Uh, I, had, I had it once explained to me that, that someone said, 80% of people are, are easy to work with on this. They're going to go do it when I say go do it. It's the 20% where I waste all my time. It's the 80-20 uh, it's the rule. And if you can make it so that the process is so is clean, understandable, and works, no matter where you are in your purchasing structure, wherever you are and what you're trying to accomplish, I think you really do show a greater return on the investment because now you can say, we identified what our outcome is, we identified how we're going to make it happen, and now we have ultimately been able to pick a tool or build a workflow within the tool that reflects what we're trying to accomplish. And we can communicate it internally. We can explain why this works. And of course, you get your metrics, you get your, you get your information, because now you know if everything keeps being lost at stage five of the process, there's a problem somewhere between stage four and stage five. So I want to move us along, but before we do, I just want to put a bit of a point on it myself, which is almost every project that I've ever worked on of any type throughout my entire career that goes sideways, it's, it's often because you lose sight of the objectives. So I think that, that it's not only critical to set objectives at the, outside of a, at the outset of a project, and I think generally speaking in legal, we're not always, not, we may not be seeing enough of that, right? Because I think a lot of it is, let's get some contract management in here. Look, everyone's doing contract management. We need to do contract management. And you really have to pause at the beginning and say, okay, that's probably a good idea, but what is it we're actually trying to do? And then keep that as your North Star throughout the project. Because usually when things start getting messy, it's because someone forgot what you're actually trying to do. Brad, I quite seriously had this conversation on a Friday where someone called us up to talk about contract management, my question was, well, where's your, where's your legal team? We don't have one. And I'm like, okay, well, what are you trying to do? And they said, well, we really just want to automate this process and make sure that every, all, of our, all of our financial professionals are pulling the exact same template, no matter what it is. And I said, great. That's, you need a document repository that automate and automation. Right. And again, it's, we can do that, but it, we had to, and I shortened that conversation with an hour and a half to get to that point, but it, it was that, what is your objective? We want to make sure that everybody always uses the same exact document every time. And we want to have control over that. And I said, okay, great. And when the legal, and then they said, by the way, we're excited about this because when the legal team starts and sorry, Brad, I know that we have a time constraint. But when the legal team starts, those documents will be in a repository so they're not having to run around. It, it was actually one of the nicest things. I said, you guys must love lawyers. And they go, yes, they're a necessary evil. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll take necessary evil over unnecessary evil. Exactly. Um, good. So we have a few more data points I just want to get through and get some commentary on from you guys. Um, we'll do these in pair. So we ask, in regards to your CLM, what data do you currently track? And the most common data that's tracked is whether things are on company versus third party paper, um, contract volume, contract value. Um, the, but I think what's maybe more interesting for us to discuss is our question of what is the most valuable thing that you track? And far and away, the number one response was contract turnaround time and, and cycle time. So. Maybe we don't have a lot of time. Maybe if you each want to take a, a minute or so and just, just talk about what you see as the most valuable to track um, and and why it's maybe important to figure it out. It doesn't surprise me, Brad, that cycle time, you know, whether it's on the buy side, uh, it's the procurement of much needed goods and services to facilitate the running of the overall enterprise. And of course, as you mentioned, Brad, earlier on the sell side, it's speed to revenue. So clearly uh, that metric is going to be up there ahead of anything else. Uh, you know, in our prep for this, uh, we did talk about what is missing here. And I am gonna you know, go back to the 
from the previous discussion, I do find it intriguing that organizations are not tracking at any significant level of uptake the cost to create a contract by the organization. What is the actual cost of the contract management function at an organization? Because if you're going back to the original point about uh, the increase tendency to uh, be creating value to the broader enterprise of the legal department or a function within the legal department, if you're not able to convey the overall cost of producing a contract and you're not tracking that data, then how can you actually convey your value to the organization? So no surprises about cycle time. I would like to see organizations starting to drive insights from the cost of contract production. So I think go ahead, Jerry. Go ahead. I was going to say, I, I agree with Mark. I think that there is a great deal of data that could be based on on this and looking at whether you know contract professionals, legal professionals, LDO professionals can drive uh, almost a reduction in the I, I think of it as almost like a, a cost of goods sold the the underlying the underlying functional cost of delivering legal services within an organization got it good so let's um let's just talk for just a minute about this as we uh, and then we'll, we can maybe wrap but um we ask about use of artificial intelligence in um really across the board but specifically we ask around in, in contract management and we're seeing um, you know, in both cases, right around half of our audience saying they use artificial intelligence um, in these areas. Um, Jerry, it's right in the name of your company. So maybe uh, you want to take a run of where the value is here. It is. Uh, uh, <laughs> thanks, Brad. It is in the name of our company. Um, where, where we see it is, we see it on both sides. You know, we are one of those uh, in full life cycle products. We don't just focus on one side. Uh, the two big areas we see it in right now are on intake, document analysis, and initial comparison against a set of defined uh, requirements. So you could say, uh, usually one of our showcase one of our showcase items is, hey, here is a list of what we found that doesn't match your requirements in the contract. And we can score based on whether or not it meets those requirements. On the other side, and again, being mindful of time, because I'd be happy to talk about this for an hour or two, um, where we see the, the vast majority is analysis and extraction of terms and ultimately reporting on those terms. Where, where where do I think that this is going to go? I think we're going to see more of this. I don't think it displaces anybody, but what it does do is it enables folks to get through their job faster, make sure they're getting it. I like to think of it more as augmented intelligence rather than artificial intelligence, because the, the purpose of the tool is not to, not to be an artificial brain, but to help you make better decisions. But the two basic cases are finding finding issues in the first place and then knowing what's in there and knowing what's in there when you're done got it so let, let's do this because we are at the uh, top of the hour so i'm going to um mark i'm going to give you the last word here i think because uh, around really anything around this uh, around the topic of the expansion of the role of the legal operations professional as well as contract management before we do that um i just want to Propose here's the link for downloading the survey report. Feel free to visit this anytime and download um, download the report. So Mark, uh, before we just say goodbye, what else you got? Thanks, Brad. Uh, thanks everybody for attending. All, all I would simply say is I do think there is a journey that we're on, uh, both 
more broadly with law department operations, legal ops professionals and contract management as a discipline where I am incredibly optimistic about what the future holds, particularly for the contracting function. I think we're increasingly seeing our clients and thought leaders in the industry and the technology companies coming together, viewing contracts rather than being legal documents exclusively being viewed as strategic business assets and the legal department and the contracting function rather than being seen as a source of frustration and delay being viewed as a value creator for the overall enterprise and i'm seeing all of the various stakeholders on the client side legal tech and services provider side working towards those admirable goals and i'm very optimistic about the future yeah I, I love that it seems like both contracts and legal operations professionals themselves are more and more being viewed as to use your term a strategic business asset and i think that's that's good for everybody so mark jerry let me thank you for joining us today i thought that was a, a very insightful session um, I hope you and the audience did as well. And thank you for joining us too. And, and uh, thanks so much. And we look forward to seeing you on the next webinar and throughout the year. Um, take care, everybody. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everyone else.